Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the St. James's Place Asia Client Conference 2021. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us virtually today. This is Junlin Tan, Senior Partnership Development Manager at St. James's Place, and I will be your host this evening. Almost two years of the COVID-19 pandemic globally has certainly had many of us revisit our values, concerns, and priorities in life. The limitations in accessing certain tangibles in life, which bring us joy, such as traveling abroad for a holiday, has somewhat helped us see more clearly today's issues, truly important to the well-being of not only ourselves, but the people we care about. The pandemic has also contributed to a change in our relationship with money. The latest findings of the St. James's Place Money Relationship Monitor Report, which was established through over 2,000 interviews across both Singapore and Hong Kong, shows that three quarters of those surveyed are now more cautious with their money. An overwhelming 70% in Singapore and 56% in Hong Kong are also more concerned about planning for their retirement in the face of COVID-19. There is little doubt that the pandemic has accelerated our awareness of social issues and climate change. 65% of respondents say COVID-19 has increased their motivation to invest responsibly. However, two-thirds did not believe that corporates are doing enough to address environment or social issues. Whilst many of us in our day-to-day -day living here, and especially Asia, would think nothing much of toggling one or two degrees on our air conditioners or heater controls, an extra 1.5 degrees of global warming can be catastrophic and create devastating impacts. Remember, we're not spared in Asia. Rising sea levels coupled with severe weather changes and potential damage to the food and water systems could become a much bigger issue in the long run. If this continues, we could ultimately find ourselves and our next generations living in a world where lethal heat waves strain living and health conditions together with challenged water and food supplies are the norm. You could, of course, create a positive impact today by taking a bus instead of driving, taking shorter showers, or create less waste. But imagine, imagine if you could contribute to a much bigger force for positive change to the world you live in. What if you could influence the environmental policies of some of the world's biggest businesses? What if, on top of being a force for good in this world, you could also make healthy decisions today to chart your own financial future and future for next generations tomorrow. What you will gain from today's conference is a sense of clarity from leading experts across the world on how you can create real impact for both your future and the environment and a good understanding of the obstacles that often get in the way of making healthy investment decisions as well as the steps you can take. So, if you care about the environment and don't like making bad investment decisions, then this event is absolutely for you. But first, some housekeeping rules before we move on to the agenda of this evening's program. So to the bottom right of your window, you should see an option to drag your screen wider to make your virtual experience with us today more enjoyable. So this is an interactive conference and we appreciate you might have some questions for our speakers as the conference is ongoing. You should see a questions box in your left panel, so please feel free to submit your questions in this box for our speakers. And with that information, it is time for you to enjoy our Asia Client Conference. So today we will be hearing from three leading experts to give you that clarity on how you can be a force for good in both your lives and the world we live in. Joining us live from London, you will in the later part of this evening learn more about defining your impact from Robert Gardner, Director of Investments and Executive Board Member at St. James's Place. Through a fireside discussion moderated by my co-host Angelina Lai in Hong Kong, 
Robo shed light on how SJP and our fund managers are truly making an impact in the world. This fireside discussion will also focus on creating your own impact for your family's financial future and a lasting legacy. Angelina will also be speaking with Johanna Kirkland, Group CIO and Global Head of Multi-Asset Investment for Schroders, with an important message on ignoring the noise. Johanna will be providing you with her views on the market and how Schroders strive to help clients achieve sustainable returns. But first, live from Atlanta in the United States at 4 a.m., I am pleased to introduce Dr. Daniel Crosby, Chief Behavioral Officer at Orion Advisor Solutions and a best-selling author. Dr. Crosby is a psychologist and a behavioral finance expert who helps organizations and individuals understand the intersection between our minds and the markets. He also recently co-authored a New York Times best-selling book, Personal Benchmark, Integrating Behavioral Finance and Investment Management. Dr. Crosby will start this evening's conference by helping you understand healthy investing, behavioral biases and the psychology behind making healthy investment decisions. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Crosby. Thank you so much, June Lin, and thank you for all of you for joining me here. Good morning, good early morning from America. It's my pleasure to be here with you today and to talk to you as advertised about your body, your brain, the psychology of investment decision-making, some of what we've been through uh, emotionally over the last two years, and how we can make better, healthier decisions. We're going to begin today, if you'll go to my first slide, please, we're going to begin today by talking about your body. We're going to begin at the very beginning. We're going to talk about the bodies in which we all move around, and we're going to talk about how we face an, an alarming paradox. If we could go to that first slide, please, we're going to talk about how we, we move around in bodies that were wired for a different place and time. You and I have bodies that haven't had an upgrade in nearly 200,000 years. And to understand the perils we face as investment decision makers, it's best if we understand that apparatus. So we were wired for a different place and time. In fact, we know that if we go back many, many thousands of years ago, we weren't the only humanoid species on the block, and yet we know that we are the only ones that survived. So what is the difference? What kept us around when other humanoid species didn't live to tell the tale? Well, there are some conflicting opinions, but the prevailing opinion is now that Homo sapiens lived to fight on because we were the best risk managers. We were the most fearful. We were the most risk averse. We were the most loss averse of any of the humanoid species. And so we lived to fight on and to tell the tale. In a very real sense, you and I are here today because our great, great, great ancestors were scared. They were scared of loss they were fearful of risk, and that is why we are here today. But of course, we now live in a very different place and time where we need to take risk, and the risk in our lives are more emotional uh, than they are physical, and yet we keep with us that same apparatus. If we go to the next slide, we see that another thing that is true about the body is that it is easily moved from optimal decision-making. Our bodies are always striving for equilibrium. Our bodies are always striving for homeostasis or equilibrium. And anything that moves us from that set point can cause us to make a bad decision. So one of my favorite studies to illustrate this is actually done on the decisions of Israeli judges. 
A study was done that looked at the determinants of, of uh, judicial decision making for Israeli judges and tried to determine what were the prevailing factors in whether they handed down a harsh sentence or a lenient sentence uh, when presented with a case. Now, they looked at many different factors, but would you believe that the number one predictor of whether or not that judge handed down a harsh sentence or a lenient sentence was how recently they had eaten? You see that early in the day, the judges are very generous. The judges are magnanimous. They're handing down easy, light sentences. But as, we, as the morning wears on and we approach some hunger, some tiredness, that body begins to wear down, the sentences passed down become more and more strict, more and more stringent. Then the judge has a morning snack. And what do you know? Uh, the sentences get light again. The sentences get a little bit easier. This goes on again until lunch. And as we approach lunch, the sentences get hard again. The judges get tough again and so on until dinner time. It is scary to think that some of the best educated people in the world make decisions that are largely guided by their stomachs. And it's scary to think that all of us do the same things. We move through the world in these imperfect bodies that are so easily moved from this set point, all the time making decisions uh, beneath our awareness. If we'll go to the next slide, I want to talk now about our brains. Because it's important to understand the brain if we are to understand how we think about and make investment decisions. Now, one of the things that you need to understand about your brain is that it is a small but very hungry part of your body. Your brain accounts for somewhere between 2 to 3% of your body weight, so a very small percentage of your total body weight but it accounts for 20 to 25% of the calories that we expend in a given day. So what do we do with this huge mismatch? We have a brain that takes up about 10 times as much energy as it should. And so one of the ways that we try to conserve energy is actually by deferring to other people. We defer to other people on things like what sort of toothpaste should I use? Or what sort of sneakers should I buy? Uh, we look to other people. We look to celebrities and others to tell us how to live our lives because, frankly, our brains are tired. Our brains are tired. They wear out easily. And our brains are wired not to make rational decisions in the strictest sense, but to make cooperative decisions. And you actually saw this a lot during the pandemic. You saw a lot of this herd behavior, and you certainly saw it in markets where large groups of people piled into investments that were in some cases risky or ill-advised because of this communal decision-making. So again, one of the ways that we try and shortcut the limitations of these brains that are so, so overworked is that we look around us and defer to other people when making investment decisions, but those decisions may not always be right for us. So we have these weak bodies, we have these old brains that are effectively the iPhone one of decision-making living in an iPhone 13 world. So the, the result of this is a number of biases. If we go to the next slide, Biases, psychological biases, are simply shortcuts we make in our decision making that may not always serve us well. And what is incredible to consider is that psychologists like myself have now documented over 200 different biases with respect to financial decision making. That is right. There are 200 different ways that your mind can trick you into making bad decisions about money. That's the bad news. The good news is, though, that these fall into one of four predictable meta biases that we can understand and manage and control for. 
So much of my work has been around taking this universe of 200 biases and trying to understand the core psychological principles that undergird those 200 biases. And what I found in my research for my most recent book, The Behavioral Investor, is that there are really four things that we need to be attuned to. That these weak bodies, that these tired minds lead us to make four types of predictable errors. And so I wanna share these with you today so that you can understand them and along with your wealth manager, guard against them uh, in your own thinking, in your own decision-making. So the first of these that we'll talk about is ego. Now, ego is simply overconfidence, but overconfidence takes a number of flavors in the human family. The first is that we think we are better than other people. We think that on average, we are better and different than other people. And I'm afraid to say for the men in the group that this is actually more pronounced in men. Um, one of the studies that I share in, in my book was a study of 700 men that found that 95% of those men uh, thought that they were funnier than average, had a better than average sense of humor. 100% of those men uh, thought that they were a better than average friend. And 94% of those men thought that they were better looking than average. Now, we understand, of course, that this cannot be the case, guys. We can't all be, uh, we can't all be friendly and smart and have six-pack abs. This is not the way that averages work. And yet we see that almost everyone thinks that they are better than other people. This is very pronounced. We see it in measures of, of driving, uh, investing, decision-making. On average, we think we are different and better than other people. But it's not just that. We also think that we are luckier than other people. When people are asked how likely they are to have bad things happen to them, uh, something like getting a divorce or, or getting sick with uh, an illness like cancer, they rate the likelihood of those things as very, very low, even though, of course, getting sick or, or getting divorced is, in fact, quite likely from a population standpoint, from a, from a probabilistic standpoint. We rate those things low, but when people are asked how likely they are to win the lottery, uh, they rate that as very likely or very high. So we tend to uh, offload things that are dangerous and we tend to try and own things that are optimistic. That's another form of ego. So we think we're lucky, uh, we think that we're smart, and then the final thing, the final piece of ego is that we think that we can predict the future. Uh, we think we have greater insights into the future than we actually do. And that is, of course, not the case. A study of 80,000 Wall Street estimates of, of uh, consensus future earnings estimates found that they were right less than one time in 170 so if the smartest people uh, in the financial world can't predict the future movement of markets, neither can we. Uh, the second thing we have to guard against, and we'll spend some time on this in a moment, is emotion. E emotion is just, of course, this tendency to let our heart rule our head when making investment decisions, and that's a very common trait. The third is attention, which is our tendency to confuse things that are loud with things that are likely. Well, what do I mean by this? When I, when I mean confuse what's loud and what's likely, I mean uh, mistaking headlines for things that are likely to happen. So for instance, many, many more people die each year from taking selfies than die from shark attacks. It's about nine times as many people die uh, from taking selfies as die from shark attacks but one of them seems louder. One of them seems more headline worthy, the shark attacks. And so we're more fearful of it, even though the danger is not uh, the same. And then the final thing is conservatism, which is our tendency to confuse what we know with what is safe. So in every country that we have studied, people tend to over allocate their resources and their investments to the stocks and bonds of their home country.
They tend to over-index and over-invest in the industry in which they work, and they tend to confuse the things they know with things that are safe in capital markets, and that's just simply not the case. So I want to drill down a little bit on emotion now. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this has been an emotional two years. And my, my time today is short, so I don't have time to talk about all four of these in, in similar depth. But I want to talk about some of the emotions of the last year and talk about what we can do about it. There's three really big emotions that I've seen. And the first is fear. Now, it's important to understand that the fear that we have felt over the last two years, the psychological fear, is indistinguishable from real physical danger. The fear you feel when you watch your portfolio drop by 20 or 30 percent has the exact same physiological thumbprint as being chased by a wild animal or being a victim of a crime, right? Your heart races, you sweat, your pupils dilate, the physical response to fear, whether it's psychological uh, or, or physical, is identical. And what we know about fear is that our body is so primed to hang on to fear to protect us from future dangers. That one thing we know from our research is that people actually create mental file folders of the most dangerous things they've been through, the most fear-inducing things they've been through, so that they can reopen that folder at a time uh, when they may need it in the future. So all of us have sort of file folders in our heads that say great financial crisis or COVID crisis. And we open those up quickly the next time the market gets choppy. And this can be problematic for us from a decision-making standpoint because we actually lose 13% of our IQ. That's right, we lose 13% of our intellectual processing power when we are feeling fear. So at the very moment when we need our faculties, we need our mind, we need those great lessons that we've learned about how to make good decisions with money, we actually have least access to them. And the final thing we know is that fear makes us more biased. Fear and stress, all of these emotions we've experienced over the last two years, they make us more susceptible to falling into these bad decisional traps that I just talked about. So let's talk on the next slide about how pronounced this stress has been. We see that surveys in the UK have found that people's uh, presentation with psychological disorders like de anxiety and depression have doubled. Uh, and in the States here, in some places, they have quadrupled uh, during the pandemic. So we have all been through something. And it's appropriate for us to honor and recognize that, but to also consider the ways in which that can hamstring us and lead us to make terrible, terrible investment decisions. The final one I want to talk about, the final decision, uh, excuse me, emotion I want to talk about on the next slide is I want to talk about isolation. I talked before uh, about how we are wired for connection. Our brains are designed to work together. That is what makes humankind humankind. We're not bigger, stronger, or tougher than other animals, but what we have over other animals is our ability to work together. This is the thing, not opposable thumbs, not communication. Our ability to work together is what makes us the best animals in the animal kingdom, right? And that has been taken from us in the last two years. Now, what's incredible to consider is that we were doing poorly with isolation before COVID. Japan and the UK had actually uh, created dedicated government positions to address the epidemics of loneliness in those countries. People pre-COVID were feeling lonely and isolated, and half of Americans described themselves as very, very lonely pre-COVID. So imagine what has happened since. Loneliness isn't this high-class problem. It actually has real, uh, real physiological impact on us, 
And it's, it's twice as damaging to our bodies as being overweight. And it's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So, so far we've had some bad news, right? We've, we've got these weak bodies, we've got these outdated minds, we've got these psychological biases we all fall into, and we've been through a really, really tough two years that has left us lonely and isolated and stressed out. But with my final two slides, if we could go to the next slide, I want to give you a little hope. Because there are things that we can do. There are simple things we can do to make better decisions. Let's talk about one simple thing you can do to manage each of these four primary psychological biases that we've talked about today. What do we do to manage our ego or our overconfidence? Well, one of the things that we know about ego and overconfidence is that it can lead us to try and do too much. In fact, this is why women outperform men uh, in both professional and retail contexts as investment managers because they just do less. They have less ego. We know that in 19 different countries that we have looked at, the more people make changes to their portfolios, the less they have, uh, the less, uh, the, the lower the returns have been. So one of the things that you can do to manage your ego is to just do less, to be less active. What can we do about emotion? Well, we know that emotion is not going away. In fact, we know that people who have the emotional processing centers of their brain damaged are actually unable to make even simple decisions. People like that are unable to make decisions about what kind of ice cream they want or what color suit to wear because even very simple decisions have an emotional substrate. So if we can't overcome emotion entirely, one of the things that we can do is own it and integrate it into the way that we make investment decisions. Now, this is probably my favorite uh, investment psychology study of all time as the father of three young children. A study found that people who looked at a picture of their children before making a financial decision we're twice as likely to make wise choices about saving and investing. They took that emotion about something they loved, about a why, about a purpose, and they integrated it into the way that they made investment decisions. Own that emotion. We're gonna to talk today about sustainability, about the way that, uh, about taking something that you feel emotional about, saving the planet, doing right by the planet can be integrated into the way that you make investment decisions and can actually lead you to be more likely to stay the course and more likely to do the right thing. The third thing, what do we do about this attention, our, our tendency to confuse what's loud with what's likely? Well, the best thing that we can do is unplug. When we look at brain scans of people who are watching financial news on television, we find that the brains of people who are watching someone on television, uh, the, the parts of their brain associated with critical thinking and decision making actually go to sleep because your brain is turning over the wheel of that decision making to the person on the television. Instead of giving over your investment thinking to some stranger on TV, it's far better to have a partner who knows you, an advisor or a wealth manager who knows you, who knows your family, and knows how to help you make healthy investment decisions. What do we do about conservatism? Uh, this tendency to, to sort of stick close and go with what we're familiar with. Well, this is a great time to get out and explore the world from uh, an investment perspective. One of the hardest things for me about the last two years has been my inability to get out and see the beautiful world in which we live. I'm so glad that that's changing and that we're able to do that more now. But what you can do is explore the world through your investment allocations. Make allocations all across the world and have this be the first step in how you re-enter society. And the last thing that I'll say here about overcoming bias is to get advice. We know that people who work with a wealth manager have 2.73 times the wealth of those who do not. 
Those who have a long-term relationship with a wealth manager have 2.73 times the wealth of those who try to do it themselves, even when controlling for 55 other variables, right? This is a huge impact. We also know that they're twice as happy and twice as prepared for an emergency. Working with an advisor, working with a wealth manager is the number one way to overcome all of these pitfalls we've talked about today. And on my last slide, if we could please go to the last slide, I wanna end on a personal note. We have had such a hard year. And we're going to talk about sustainability and in investing today, but we also have to talk about sustainability of our health and our mental health. And when we look at people who are mentally healthy, they have five things in common. The first is that they have positive experiences. This is just fun. They inject fun into their lives. They look for opportunities to dance with the kids, to go on a vacation, to, to watch a movie, to let down, to do whatever it is that they find positive. The second thing that they have is they have engagement. They have deep, meaningful work in their lives. Uh, real happiness is not all about sitting on a beach with a, with a drink in your hand. Real happiness has an element of hard work in it, and we need to remember that. The third thing mentally healthy people have is deep relationships. If you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling disconnected after the last two years we've been through, look for safe, positive ways to reconnect with the people in your life that matter. The fourth thing that, that mentally healthy people have is meaning. We're going to talk about interjecting meaning into the investing process today. That's a great place to start, but mentally healthy people are working for something bigger than themselves, whether it's people or planet or, or uh, spirituality, whatever that looks like. They're working for something bigger than themselves and bigger than money. And then the final thing that they have is they have advancement. They track their goals and they monitor the ways in which they are they are smarter, better, faster today than they were yesterday. So in closing, let me just say that I hope that you can incorporate elements of each of these five uh, steps for overcoming bias and each of these five steps for getting healthy and happy as we move into the new year. We have all been through something really tough. And we, in many ways, are not wired to make great investment decisions in the face of that sort of obstacle. But with the help of a trusted advisor and a little knowledge about what makes humans great and what makes us function well, we can get there. Thank you so much for having me today and please be well. Thank you, Dano, for leading that incredibly enjoyable and insightful discussion. We now better understand how to make healthy investment decisions for ourselves. So how do we do that and create a positive impact for ourselves and this world we live in? We're going live to Hong Kong in the next segment of this conference, where my co-host Angelina Lai will be hosting a fireside discussion with both our speakers in London, Robert Gardner and Johanna Kirkland. Angelina is Head of Division Asia Investment at St. James's Place and will be hosting this next segment with both Robert and Johanna on how you can define the impact you want to create and how you can go about achieving this in today's markets. Joining us from Hong Kong, please welcome my co-host Angelina Lai. Thank you, Jolyn. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Angelina Lai, Head of Division Asia Investment at St. James's Place. As the curtains roll down in Glasgow with the completion of COP26, the UN's Climate Change Conference, we've had with us some pretty bold pledges and therefore hope. But we've also had the realization that if we fail to make these changes, this climate crisis will continue to exacerbate. 
we as humans have already induced warming of around one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Two-thirds of the way already to the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we have already seen some devastating effects, melting glaciers, wildfires, more frequent and severe storms, increased drought and flooding to name but a few, all causing critical damage to humans, animals and ecosystems. There is a significant financial cost too. Business leaders today say that four out of their five biggest risks are environmental. At St. James's Place, we believe in building long-term financial futures, thinking in decades, not days. During this segment of the conference, we will be exploring how you can make your money a force for good. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Johanna Kirkland and Rob Gardner, who join us live from UK. Johanna Kirkland is the Chief Investment Officer for Schroeder's and Manager of St. James's Place Managed Growth Fund. Rob Gardner is a Director of Investments and an Executive Board Member of St. James's Place and a financial activist on a mission to make money a force for good. Now, Rob was actually due to uh, join Johanna, Johanna from uh, Schroeder's office in London today, but um, he had unfortunately tested positive for COVID, so he's now joining from his home while in isolation. Uh, we're super grateful that Rob is still able to join us, and we hope that you can understand that he might occasionally need to have a little cough uh, mid-sentence. So good morning to you both in the UK. Thank you so much for joining us uh, bright and early, although not quite as early as he was for Daniel in Atlanta. Um, so, the view that investments are measured in value alone is changing. In a world which faces so many challenges, investing today is about, well, as Rob would say, uh, achieving financial well-being in a world worth living in. To start, I'd like to invite Rob to join me in discussing how you can define your impact through investment. Hi, Rob. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Hope you're feeling better. Um, for those who know you or may follow you on social media, one of the things that you are passionate about is using money as a force for good. And you have led many high-profile discussions regarding financial health, family, legacy, and the importance of creating financial well-being in a world worth living in. Um, could you please provide us with some insight into what this means to you? Yeah, well, look, uh, firstly, good morning. And uh, I was just reflecting on Daniel's talk. I mean, wasn't Daniel amazing? So firstly, thank you, Daniel, for joining us from Atlanta at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, and, and I was just reflecting. So I'm isolating at home. I, I tested COVID uh, for, with COVID on Sunday night. So although I'm at home, I haven't seen my kids or wife uh, since Sunday morning. I, I FaceTime with my wife, even though we're in the same in the same house. So uh, it's only been a few days, but I'm certainly feeling the impact of isolation. Uh, the good news is I've had I've had my breakfast. So uh, hopefully my decision making is uh, is up is up. But, but you asked me about uh, financial well-being in, in a world worth living in. And uh, for me, one of the, 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 the key challenges, and I absolutely agree with, with Daniel, is that the, the trick is we've got to expect the unexpected. You know, we weren't expecting me to have COVID and not to be here today, and yet we had a plan B. My colleague was going to step in just in case. Luckily, we were able to make, uh, make this work. But when it comes to your sort of financial well-being, I always think there are two parts. There's financial resilience and there's financial well-being. Uh, but by financial resilience, I mean, do you just have enough money set aside in case an emergency happens? So for a lot of people, you may have lost your job or your means of earning money over the last year or two years. Do you have enough money set aside that enables you to, to carry on living uh, even though you're not earning any money? And certainly research in the UK shows that 50% of all mental health issues are typically to do with money and indebtedness. And typically one of the number one causes of, of divorce uh, is, is also issues around, uh, is around money. And the second reason why having that kind of rainy day fund is so important 
is that is what protects you emotionally from when the market falls by 20 or 30 percent. So last, you know, in March 2020, when the market was falling the fastest and sharpest it had ever fallen, if you know, if you have a long term plan, if you've looked at that picture of your kids, I love that story, and you're investing for the long term in decades, not days, then actually you carried on investing and having money set aside uh, meant that you were you, you you stopped yourself from having that fight or flight risk that Daniel talked about. And although it feels like you're being chased by a tiger when the market is falling, you you know that actually the best thing is to to, to carry on investing. And those and those that have done that will have seen a massive impact uh, on on their financial resilience. I think the third thing I want to talk about, and I talked about this last year, is that we're all living longer. This idea of a hundred year life. The number of centenarians in the world, that's people aged over 100, is about 573,000. And that's double from what it was 10 years ago. And it is doubling every 10 years. In fact, in Singapore, I think the number of centenarians has increased 20 fold in the last 30 years. So on average, we're all living longer and we need to prepare uh, for that. And on this point, I want to introduce a concept called the good ancestor. Daniel talked about our past and what drives our brains and how we're wired. But there's this Maori concept from New Zealand called whakapapa, which is this idea that we're all connected to our past and our future selves. And that's why that, that story about looking at the picture of your kids is so important. Is if we start thinking about our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, it takes us well into the next century uh, and, and beyond. Think about it. The Queen in the UK, when her youngest great grandchildren die will be 200 years after she was born so imagine thinking with a 200 year mindset on that kind of trajectory we know that the world we live in is not a good one it's hard to imagine 2050 but 2050 is closer than 1990 and we know that right now human activity means that we're on track to, to trash the planet and we need to change that the good news is the technology exists we just need to change our behaviors and so when it comes to investing not only do we need to think about return to beat inflation and i want to talk about inflation briefly we need to think about the risk that we're taking but we also need to think about the impact that our money is having what what impact are those companies have having in the short medium and long term on the environment on the people the communities who work with them uh, and, and is that sustainable? And by the way, that feeds directly back in, uh, back into the return. And then on financial well-being, you know, Daniel talked about one of the challenges we now face is we have to take risk. And the challenge we face is that inflation, we don't really feel it day to day or week to week. But over the last 20 years, I think, you know, in Hong Kong, you've probably seen, you know, 100 Hong Kong dollars 20 years ago is probably worth... 70 Hong Kong dollars today. Uh, in Singapore, uh, it's probably worth 75 Hong Kong dollars. So 25 to 30% decrease in what you can buy with your money. In the UK, it's been even greater, actually. It's been about half. So, uh, you know, £100 20 years ago is only worth about £50 today in terms of what you can buy. And so if we live in this world where we're all living longer and we've got this sort of silent threat of inflation, uh, it's really important that we invest our money because otherwise the one thing we do know is in the future our money will be worth less and we'll be able to buy less with it. And, and, and growing our wealth to protect against that is absolutely key. That's great. Um, and actually, you talked uh, about inflation risk, and uh, let's let's talk a little bit more uh, about this, um, given that this is uh, rather topical, uh, as just last week, US headline inflation rate actually hit 6.2%, the highest in 30 years for US. Um, something that perhaps that also uh, not many people are privy to, uh, you grew up in Argentina yourself, uh, where, where you experienced hyperinflation firsthand as a child. So could you tell us uh, a little bit more about this phase of your life and uh, and how this had an impact on your, I guess, passion for investing and uh, and protecting and growing wealth for financial well-being? Yeah, so I was about seven uh, and we moved to Argentina in the 80s, which wasn't obvious for uh, a young British family to move to Argentina after the, the Falklands War. Uh, but I used to remember going shopping with my mum and dad uh, and you'd run around the supermarket and try and buy the goods before the price change. So prices changed every day. And so if you were able to buy something before the price change, you could buy it at that price. 
in fact, inflation was running at 30% a month. And, and just to sort of uh, explain to you just how much inflation was, if I took my dad's salary when we got to Argentina in January 1985, and then I looked at what that same salary would have bought him uh, four years later was one postage stamp. So that was the amount of in inflation there was. Literally in four years, his salary went from being able to provide for all of us as a family to only being able to pay for a, a, a postage stamp. Uh, I'm not sure why, there's a lot of yeah, background a bit of a feedback. <laughs> in any case, uh, yep. Let's move on nonetheless. Um, thank you, that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, so, um, I, well, we talked a little bit about, about this, uh, well, we talked quite a lot about this, actually. Um, so, as St. James's Place, long-term investing is, is one of our core principles. Now, naturally, the, the earlier that we begin on this journey, um, the, the more of a head start towards financial well-being we obtain. Um, with that said, though, finances can be very complicated, even for adults. Um, so, when it comes down to financial education, is there such a thing as too young? Well, that's what I was going to uh, try and say. So what my experience in Argentina taught me was that money wasn't safe. So I, I, my parents gave me a real sense that you had to earn money, but you had to keep hold of money. And when inflation is so high and the idea that your money can decrease by 30 percent in just one month, uh, keeping hold of your money is, is, is really is really challenging. I actually didn't learn about growing your money uh, until I started my career in finance. So I started working at Deutsche Bank and, and, and at Merrill Lynch. And this idea that you could invest your money, you could invest your money in companies, you could invest in the stock market uh, and grow your wealth and, uh, and, and prosperity. Uh, th there, is not, there is no too early. Uh, research done in 2013 by Cambridge University showed that our money saving habits, and that's the key word, are formed by the age of seven. So this is our ability to delay gratification. This is our ability to separate wants uh, from, from, from needs. Uh, and so, you know, I, I actually, uh, five years ago, wrote a children's book called Save Your Acorns to enable parents to read to their children about the importance of saving and investing, except it's just told through a parable about these squirrels uh, and the bears uh, and the monkeys. And so uh, hopefully when you read it with your kids, you can then have a conversation about what what the acorns mean and, 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 and what they learn. So the truth is you, you can't start too young. And, and actually financial education, I think, should be a lifelong lesson that we that we teach. Unfortunately, it only got put on the secondary school syllabus in the UK in 2014, and it's still not on the primary school syllabus. And yet in the US, we know that states which deliver financial education versus those that don't have higher levels of saving and lower levels of indebtedness. So uh, th there is increasing evidence uh, around the positive impact that financial education can have uh, on our future financial decision making. And therefore, our, our, as we heard from Daniel earlier, our kind of mental, uh, our, our mental well-being. Indeed. And, uh, and, and the sound financial education allows an investor to consider, I guess, the, the impact that they want to have. Um, but impact, though, is a pretty broad term that can mean many, many things. So what do you think of when considering what impact you want to have, both as an investor, but also as the individual responsible for the investment proposition at St. James's Place with over 200 billion US dollars of, uh, of client assets invested? Yeah, so look, you know, when I, when I think about investing uh, for, for, for me and my, me, me and my family, I, I want to ensure uh, that my money is doing two things, really. One is it's giving me financial well-being, and the other is it's giving me a world worth living in. And so by the financial well-being, I need to ensure that I'm growing my wealth faster than inflation, that I'm building up enough money to support me when I decide to stop working uh, and, and, and support me for, for that 100-year life. So it's crucial that I'm saving and investing uh, for my future. So that's financial well-being. But a world worth living in, it's pretty simple, really. If in 2050, uh, when I'm in the, my 70s and my, my daughters are in their 30s, if we've trashed the planet, what's, you know, what's the point in living in that world? Uh, what, one of the amazing things of the last 100 years is that we're all living longer. That's been incredible. 
Uh, one of the other things is really up until now, every generation has been wealthier than the one before. So economic prosperity uh, has been in improving from generation to generation, albeit it might be that this is the first generation or the youngest generation that are alive today, maybe the first generation that aren't as wealthy as their parents. However, if we measure prosperity not by GDP or economics or, or money, but, you know, US dollars or uh, anything else, sadly, we have destroyed our planet. In the 40 years since I was born, we now have half the flora and fauna that exist on the planet. There are less elephants, there are less whales, there are less sharks. We're destroying one, rain, one football field of rainforest every single minute. It, you know, we are literally destroying nature uh, and that is down to us and, 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 and how we act. And what, and what we know when it comes to investing, Daniel talked about exploring the world through how we invest our money. We just need to change the way that our companies act. We know that the future success of companies is dependent on their impact on people and planet and vice versa. We know that the planet and the communities uh, are are impacted by by the companies either that people choose to work for or consume from or their impact on the environment so we've got this really closely correlated interaction and so when it comes to investing i want to make sure that i'm achieving three things that for the risk i'm taking i'm generating the right level of return to grow my money faster than inflation over decades not days but i also want to make sure that it's driving positive action that that that, that those companies are not having a negative impact and ideally are driving positive impact uh, to the world uh, in which uh, you know I want to live in and that I want my children to live in and I want my grandchildren to live in. When it comes to my role as director of investments, you know, one of the things that I, that I feel incredibly privileged is the size and scale. You talked about how I'm uh, responsible for $200 billion. And the, the cool thing is, is that for all of the people on this call, if you're saving $200, $300, a month for your pension or, 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 or for your future self, that money gets pulled together into sort of a billion, $2 billion a month. And that's invested in $200 billion. And that $200 billion is invested across all of our fund managers around the world, which is about $9 trillion. And that's invested across 13,000 equities and bonds and properties around the world uh, worth about $90 trillion. So the the policies, the impacts, the decisions we make have real, real impact uh, on, uh, on on those businesses and how they interact. And so there's a real force multiplier effect, which I think is, is amazing in terms of impact. Great. Um, so, so talking about some of these impact, and of course, uh, it, it's, uh, we've talked about how much the impact would have on, uh, with the investment. Uh, and indeed, one of uh, a recent study that we commissioned at St. James's Place Asia found that two thirds of our potential clients in Hong Kong and Singapore actually said that they actively seek in information regarding ESG and sustainability credentials before investing. But the other side of it, I guess, is, is particularly in today's world where there's abundance of information and so, so much flow of, of conflicting information, and that can be extremely overwhelming. So how do you go about deciphering and understanding this to make uh, informed and balanced investment decisions? Yeah, no, great question, Angelina. And, and I think, you know, certainly a common term is, is, is sort of greenwashing. So how do you know that... Uh, who, who you're investing with is, isn't greenwashing. I, I suppose like in, in, in everything in life, there are a number of standards that you can look up and, and, and check. So I, I, th I think the first and the baseline is uh, what's called UNPRI, which stands for the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing. Uh, this, is, th this is a sort of kite mark that you have to sign up to uh, as a fund manager, as a wealth manager, uh, uh, that says that you are integrating environmental, social, and governance into, into your process. So firstly, are they, you know, are they a member of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing? Again, you can Google that, look up the company name and see if they're on the register. Second thing is you can always find out what rating they are. So SJP is, is A plus, uh, and 63% and of our, our fund managers are, are, are rated A plus. So even within that, there are different, uh, different ratings. I suppose having just come back from Glasgow and, and COP26, the second thing is, are they part of what's called 
GFANS, which is the Glasgow Financial uh, Alliance of Net Zero. So that's asset managers, asset owners, insurance companies, uh, and banks. Uh, SJP signed up last year. We were actually the first wealth manager globally to sign up when there was only $5 trillion in the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. That's now over $10 trillion. And now that forms over $130 trillion that is aligned with investing uh, for, for a net zero world. So I, again, you can look up to see if the asset manager, the wealth manager, the insurance company is a member of GFANS. Uh, so those are sort of two simple things that you could do. We do have clients who obviously work in this space who, uh, who really know their stuff and they want to know, well, what more does, what more do you do? And, and I, I suppose two things that I like that I'm proud about what SJP is part of. Uh, one is we're part of Climate Action 100 Plus. And one of the ways that we believe in addressing the problem is through engagement. Turns out that of the thousands of companies on the planet, a hundred of those are responsible for 70% of our emissions, oil and gas companies, mining companies, etc. And so we engage through Climate Action 100 Plus with those companies to ensure that those businesses transition to a net zero world. Because the easiest thing in the world would, Angelina, be for you as CIO in Asia uh, or me to simply sell a company and then buy another one. So whereas we don't think that's the right thing to do. We think the right thing to do is engage with that company and make it better. So a great example is Shell, uh, Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, in January through uh, Climate Action 100 Plus, uh, we actually uh, uh, got them to sign up to Net Zero. In April, when they made their Net Zero commitments, we voted against them. We don't think they've gone far enough. And then they subsequently revised them to a 45% reduction in CO2 by 2035. And our fund managers continue today to engage with Shell and raise, uh, raise that bar. The, the other area that we uh, you know, really try and uh, make sure that we are best in class is on stewardship and engagement. And for those clients interested, you can go on our website and download our stewardship and engagement report. We update that annually. But earlier this year, uh, we appointed Rubico, who are probably the world's, you know, the leading firm in stewardship and engagement and they support us again on how we engage with the companies in our in our fund managers portfolios great thanks rob um sorry about bear with us you okay okay i'm going to continue in, in any case thank you um so rob what is your uh, I, I guess final guidance on, on our audience today um who perhaps are considering their own impact and and how to achieve this uh, particularly through investment yeah look, I, I think there are a number of uh things and i was thinking about this uh, actually uh, the, the reality is I, I still think we have a responsibility as consumers so you know what we eat what we wear how much we consume makes makes a difference the second thing is as citizens you know holding our politicians to account on net zero uh commitments and other commitments is is hugely important so you, you know if, if if we're fortunate enough to live in a in a country where we get a democratic vote how we respond as citizens is huge uh in the communities we operate in we can make a difference so you know when i you know i've got two young girls the school we go, how we interact with our communities makes a big difference. But it, as you heard, 100 companies make 70% of world CO2 emissions. So how we engage with those companies, how we get the companies we work for to interact makes, makes a huge difference. One of the things I like to tell people in the UK is uh, if you don't know where your pension is invested, contact your HR department and find out, is your pension invested responsibly? What are their policies uh, around this? How are they thinking about net zero? What commitments have they made? Because the amazing thing is, you know, research done by Nordea said, shows that if you invest your pension uh, in a sustainable and responsible style of investing for over 40 years, that's 27 times more impactful than flying less, eating less red meat uh, and, and cycling to, to, to work. So I, I suppose the key message is that how your money invest is invested makes a real difference. If you don't know how your money is invested, I suppose my number one uh, call to action would be go and go and find out, speak to your HR department, find out about where your pension is invested. Uh, you know, if you're an SJP client, and if you don't know, definitely speak to your SJP partner and learn about all of the stuff that we do on your behalf to make sure that your money is delivering financial well-being in a world worth living in. 
Thank you, Rob. I always really enjoy hearing your views and, and stories and, and love how passionate you are about making a difference. I'd like now um, to welcome back Johanna to the screen. Um, Johanna and I are going to develop this discussion and take a deeper look at how ignoring short-term noise and focusing on longer-term goals can produce sustainable returns for investors. Hi, Johanna. I hope you're well. Um, so Hello. Let's straight to the uh, to the big picture i guess let's start with the big picture um so many things are, are feeling rather uncertain these days uh we have inflationary pressures that we talked about earlier an uh, energy crisis concerns about tapering and potentially rising interest rates geopolitical risks china contagion evergrand the list goes on um so what would be your advice to clients now Well, of course, you know, every environment is always different. There's always new elements, but there are some underlying patterns. And what we're seeing right now is very typical of what you get when the economic cycle is maturing. You know, we've had a very strong reopening since vaccines were announced this time last year. And now we're seeing a sort of moderation in that economic recovery. And typical of this phase of the cycle is concerns about valuation, concerns about peaking growth momentum and of receding central bank liquidity. Now, all our work suggests so that there is still more money to be made from equities. So ultimately, yields are still low, corporate earnings are still firm. So I think it's too early to withdraw into our bear caves, um, if you will. Certainly, our advice would be to remain invested. Um, moving slightly on to uh, fixed income. So with yields so low, um, do you think that bonds still have a role to play in portfolios? Um, what about gold uh, or cryptocurrencies? So there is still some room to go in terms of the repricing of inflation risk and rate risk in bonds. So, you know, we would still be underweight that asset class, but I wouldn't write them off entirely because ultimately there is still a re risk of peaking growth momentum in 2022 and central banks are still very actively managing the long end of the curve. So I think there is still a role for government bonds in the portfolio. However, we do need to think about potentially a more inflationary environment for years to come, partly as a result of the pandemic. And in that context, I think there are other allocations we need to consider as a source of diversification in the portfolio. So gold could be one of those. Gold historically has been a good hedge against um, low real yields, rising inflation. So I think that, that is a good allocation. We also like the dollar because it's actually a good hedge against the potential for liquidity to recede. Um, with regard to cryptocurrencies, my view is more mixed. I think the cryptocurrencies are a way of maybe benefiting from this new money technology. I see that more as a return generator than a hedge in the portfolio. I think sometimes crypto is positioned as an alternative to gold, as a store of value. And I think that actually that is not the right way to think about it. It is not a defensive asset class. It's a way of generating return, as I said, from the adoption of the, of the new technology. Very interesting. Moving slightly on to a topic more closer to, I guess, the theme of this uh, this conference and also close to my own heart. Um, Schroeder's are known as a leader in sustainability, um, but lo and way long before ESG even became a popular concept. So as early as 19 years ago, um, Schroeder had, Schroeder's had already in, uh, started to engage Royal Dutch Shell on its climate ambitions. Uh, and now Shell has set a target to become a net zero emissions energy business by 2050, which is quite impressive. So can you please share your views on the role that investors can have in driving business agenda and uh, environmental commitments? As active investors, we believe passionately in engaging with companies to ensure that ultimately they're, they're creating more sustainable business. So by engaging with them on matters we think are going to matter over the long term, we believe that then ultimately we're essentially uh, ensuring a thriving investment universe for uh, from which we can pick our stocks. So it's in our interest to engage with companies, as I said, to ensure that we then have a very broad range of investments to pick up from. And Shell is a good example of that, you know, engaging with them over the years to a point where now today, they're a company that even as an oil company, you can consider investing in, uh, in the context of a sustainable transition. Um, so for us, it is about creating that great investment universe. Now, crucially though, in terms of engaging with companies, obviously, you know, we can, be active at AGMs, which we often are. But I think it's also about the work we do behind the scenes with companies over a period of years, really working with them, using our tools often to understand their businesses. 
So I'll give you an example of that. We have a proprietary um, tool called Carbon VAR, which allows us to assess the impact of rising carbon prices on a company's earnings. That's the kind of tool that we can use to engage with companies on climate to help them understand the risk that they are running in their business. Uh, and obviously, the resources we have are significant in this area. So again, a simple example of how we engage over the long term with our companies. And why do does play such large emphasis on sustainability? Uh, and, uh, and what can that mean for investors? Well, if you think about it, I mean, after 1929, the Great Depression, you saw the standardization of accounting standards, um, you know, starting from the United States, which pretty much everyone has been using as investors ever since. And that allowed us to really understand the inner workings of a company better, but ultimately ignored the broad impact to society of that company's activities, the positive and uh, negative externalities that they generated. What we've developed in recent years is the ability to assess those that broader impact to society of each company that we invest in. And it gives us a much deeper understanding of the environment within which they're operating, the risks that they're taking, and ultimately the sustainability of their business over the long term. So for us, it's an important dimension of active investment is understanding um, those broader impacts. We see it as a source of analytical advantage that actually positions us to, to outperform our peers over the long term uh, with our investment performance. So that's how we think about it. We really see it as an opportunity um, to generate stronger returns for our clients. Um, in terms of the lessons from the pandemic, it's quite interesting because, um, you know, I also listened to the presentation earlier and I thought that was very relevant. There are a number of lessons. I mean, first of all, like the financial crisis of 2008, what the pandemic showed us is sometimes extreme events do happen and you have to have the imagination to understand that. I think having been through the financial crisis this time as investors, we were much quicker to understand the implications of the pandemic you know, and how extreme it could get. So that was a lesson we learned in 2008, but we've been reminded of with the pandemic. I think there are two other key lessons that we've learned from the pandemic. One is obviously it allowed us to work in new ways, really using technology to interact. And while obviously in-person interaction is also important, as investors, it also allows us to spend time sometimes at home in, in the relative silence of our homes, and also allows us to share information more broadly across the company using virtual techniques. So I think actually um, the pandemic allowed us to work in a way that was more flexible, but ultimately also more conducive to making better investment decisions. Coming back to the point made earlier about maybe doing a little less and having a bit more silence in our lives so that we could really think things through. And I think finally, what the pandemic showed also was the importance of looking after your employees. And this is something that we engage with our companies as well. You know, people talk a lot about climate, but also ensuring that when with investing in companies that treat their work as well, we actually believe that again results in better long-term performance. Uh, and I think the pandemic reminded us that we need to understand um, the challenges that our employees might be facing outside of the office. You know, it, it, it led us to a much more holistic understanding of our employees. And again, it's something that, again, we bring to bear uh, when we look at the companies that we invest in. your insights into relationship and how it may differ from other institutional relationships that you have? I think the big difference is how we partner about the overall structure of the portfolio. So, you know, when we were first talking, we, we managed this mandate for many years at Schroeder's and really our objective has always been working in partnership with St. James's Place to really think about how we can evolve that portfolio over time to create what I call a living and breathing portfolio that adapts to the new challenges. Um, so, you know, historically, for example, we had quite a UK home bias for many years. We've moved to a more global approach in recent years, which has been very beneficial to the returns. And that's something that we worked on in partnership with St. James's Place. So as I said, it's really a portfolio focused on the long term, looking to evolve um, over many years to, to cope with a, a changing environment. And I think the interesting thing about the pandemic is it's created so much disruption that actually having that inbuilt flexibility and that ability to work together on the broader shape of the portfolio, I think stands us in good stead. You know, again, as mentioned earlier, you can't necessarily predict the future, but what you want to have is a structure that can adapt to new environments uh, quickly. And that's something I think that we've built with this, with, with this partnership that we have with St. James's Place. So much for sharing your thoughts, Johan. Insightful.
I'm now going to bring Rob Gardner back for our Q&A segment. To the audience, um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask any of our experts who have appeared this evening, um, so that's Rob, Johanna or Daniel, all you need to do is to put them into the chat function. Hi there. Hi both. UK Rob. <laughs> Good. Um, let's go straight to uh, to the questions. Um, so, um, research by both uh, St James's Place and Schroeder suggests that sustainability factors are more important now than before the pandemic. Uh, why do you think that is? Anyone would like to take this one? I'm happy to jump in. Um, sorry, can you, can, they can hear me, yeah. So basically, I think that the number of things that happened, I think that um, actually in the midst of the pandemic, again, there was that sort of moment of silence which allowed people to really focus on what mattered. And I think that what really impressed me was the way that the European authorities in particular coalesced around this idea of a Green New Deal in the depths of the pandemic in, you know, the spring of 2020. Um, and that led to a huge raft of regulation that is essentially starting to crystallize some of those negative externalities um, associated with carbon. Um, so actually, we're seeing, again, the explanatory power of looking at the carbon intensity of each company. We look at that as a factor in investment. We're seeing that, that the explanatory power of that variable has gone up as a result of the fact that governments, particularly in Europe, have got more active on this front. And then the other element is also the social. So when we speak with our American clients, what we find there is that the pandemic highlighted the need to focus more on social issues. You know, maybe the absence of, for example, a public health system in the States was part of that. Uh, but what that has led to is, again, an understanding of the need to sort of look after the weaker members of society. Uh, and again, that has led to an increase in uh, um, an increased focus on sustainability, really more in the social sense in the United States. So, so that's, those are a couple of areas where I've seen quite major movement. It's very interesting and, and certainly sustainability from a, from a different angle. Um, okay, um, moving on to some of uh, the questions that we, we are actually starting to receive uh, questions from the audience. Um, so um, our professional money managers Oh, Ashley, sorry. Uh, for this one, I would like to uh, bring Daniel back, please. Hi there, Daniel, and thank you Hi. for still being with us. Yes. Um, this is quite an interesting one, uh, particularly following your presentation earlier. Um, so are professional money managers any better at dealing with bias than anyone else? And are there any mistakes that you regularly see financial service organizations make? So it's, it's an interesting question. So the answer is in client portfolios, yes. In their own portfolios, no. So when individual, when professional money managers manage their own money, they tend to make many of the same mistakes that, that you and I make. But when they manage money on behalf of their clients, they tend to be far superior than when managing their own money. So it's an interesting insight into the way that the mind works. Uh, when we have a degree of separation, we're able to operate with the objectivity and the lack of emotionality that's required. Uh, but when it comes to our own money, uh, we tend to lose that objectivity. So it's interesting. I tell people um, I'm a financial advisor. I've written a number of books on, on the things that I've spoken about today. And yet I pay someone to manage my money. Uh, because I know that having written books on these things and, and having learned about these things doesn't make me immune from falling prey to the same mistakes. So I think it's good for everyone, professional or otherwise, to pay to have that objectivity that's, that's so central to avoiding the mistakes we discussed today. I jump in with something. Angelina, just I completely agree with Daniel on this. I find this very interesting. I see that even in my own personal life. Um, and in professional, certainly in our, in our team at Schroeder's, what I always say is our investment processes are designed to cope with failure. So the reality of being a firm manager is that even if you're doing a good job, you're getting things wrong at least 40% of the time. And that's actually if you're beating the market. 
And so actually all our investment processes are geared towards coping with that chronic failure and basically ensuring that through peer scrutiny and a high level of discipline that we recognize those mistakes early. And unfortunately, I can't replicate that in my personal life. But that's absolutely, I mean, I found Daniel's uh, presentation fascinating because actually our processes are all about trying to cope with those behavioral biases. That's very interesting. Um, we have a question um, from Hervé in the audience, um, which I guess uh, relates somewhat to Johanna's uh, discussion earlier. Um, so beyond carbon emissions, that action, uh, what, what other actions do St. James's Place take to make positive impacts on areas such as tobacco, alcohol, etc. And I guess also uh, Rob probably will have some thoughts given that you were uh, at COP26 earlier as well. Yeah, I, 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 a couple of comments. So I suppose what, you know, one of the challenges with COP26 is that it all gets focused on climate change, uh, which is huge and, and impacts the entire planet. So it's probably right that it gets uh, the measurement uh, that it does. Uh, but, but there are a whole load of issues, and that's why we talk about environmental, social, and, and, and governance factors. Uh, before I answer the question about what do we do with, with, with other industries, I, I want to talk about this kind of concept called the spectrum of, of capital. So it's more nuanced than, than people think. So, uh, you know, before I joined St. James's Place, uh, I used to work in the pensions industry, advising large institutional pension funds around the world. That, that's kind of my, my core expertise. And uh, what we saw sort of 15, 20 years ago was this concept called ethical investing, which was really this idea that we screened out entire sectors. So we'd say uh, either because of our values, we don't want to invest in tobacco companies or we don't want to invest in oil and gas and we divest from them. One of the challenges with that, certainly in the late 90s and early 2000s, is that tobacco as an industry, as a sector, did very well. And therefore, if you did ethical investing, your performance was less good than if you hadn't done that. So a lot of people are con sometimes concerned that if they invest their money responsibly or sustainably, that they're going to miss out on, on good, good performance. Uh, as we move across that spectrum, the second thing people do uh, is sort of screening. And so you can buy data, you can buy ESG data from companies such as MSCI, from Sustainalytics, that will give you a rating, a bit like a credit rating agency for different companies and say, how good or bad is that, that company? And you go, well, you know, guess what? We'll just buy the really good ones and not own the really bad ones. The challenge with that approach is that that's really a backward looking way. It would be like driving, just looking in your rear view mirror and not looking out of your out the windshield in front of you, uh, because in a way that has already happened. And quite often the financial performance, the financial returns are to be had sometimes from those less good companies and actually re-rating as they start to improve their, their, their ESG metrics. And especially actually if you're using your role as an investor, as a shareholder to, to, improve, uh, to improve those companies. So again, uh, there is some skepticism about, about that. There's also this concept called additionality, which just says, uh, you know, if I go into my garden and someone's thrown some rubbish in my garden, if I just throw it into the next door neighbours, it's true, I have no rubbish in my garden, but there's now rubbish in my next door neighbours garden. I haven't actually done anything about it. And so uh, I could build a really low carbon portfolio just by shelling, selling Shell and BP and buying Microsoft. You know, Microsoft has a very low uh, sort of carbon intensity per sort of million dollars of revenue. And so I could just sell two companies and buy one uh, and, it, and it doesn't make... Uh, it doesn't make the problem go away. So what, what does that mean is that we do not divest uh, from, from any business. We, we, we have been working with Rubico to develop our exclusions, but really the exclusions are, are to do with uh, really around mun munitions uh, and specific armaments. But when it comes to divesting, let's say, from tobacco, it's very difficult to draw the line because... Do you draw the line at a supermarket that sells tobacco? Do you draw the line at airports that sell tobacco? Do you draw the line at airlines that sell tobacco on, uh, on, 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 the, on their plane? Uh, so everything that we do is for our engagements. Uh, for those who are interested, I would really encourage you to read our, our stewardship and engagement report. And this is exactly why we have hired Rubico to help us. Because not only do we rely on Johanna as one of our fund managers, 
and all of our other fund managers around the world to do their own engagement. This is an extra layer on top that we want to do to make sure that this is consistent with our investment beliefs and our investment processes in terms uh, of how we interact. But absolutely, what we are trying to do is, is not just measure the financial risk and return of our, our investments, but we also want to know what impact they're making. That might be on the environment, that might be on their contribution to a one and a half degree C world, but it might be on water quality, it might be on social issues, it might be on plastics. Uh, and these are all important metrics that, that we need to track and measure. That's great. Um, we have a question from John saying, what factors do you consider when investing in sustainable real estate? Yeah, so yeah, our, our real estate fund uh, in the UK, so the moment we, our property fund is, is all UK property. I think we're the largest or second largest property retail property fund in, in, in the UK. It's over three billion pounds. Uh, and that's a great example of where we've really engaged with Orchard Street, our property fund manager. They actually just a few weeks ago brought forward their net zero commitments to 2040. Uh, they're a big part of our own uh, net zero asset management uh, commitments. So one of the areas where a lot of investors have focused is equities because it's probably the easiest place to do it. It's slightly harder in fixed income and it's slightly harder in property. But they have been reducing the carbon intensity of that property fund by about 10% a year. Uh, for the last three years. And actually a big part of this change is not big dramatic announcements or statements. It's kind of ordinary things consistently done over a long period of time, I believe uh, can create an extraordinary outcome. So again, last year in 2020, they took one of their industrial estates, refurbished it, and it was the first net zero industrial estate uh, in in London to, to, to be that. Uh, so uh, the, the work that uh, Orchard Street have done is amazing. And then I suppose that has now been vindicated in performance. So Bream, which is part of the property industry, has shown that actually it turns out that properties where we have invested in them, where we have improved their efficiency. So in the UK, we have a, a, a it's called EPC, but it's how efficient is the property or what's its environmental impact. It's a bit like when you open your fridge and it tells you how efficient your fridge is in terms of energy. Well, it turns out that properties now that have a higher EPC rating can command a higher yield and therefore a better financial performance. And actually, those that don't uh, have actually seen uh, their, their yields decrease. And as more and more companies commit to net zero, clearly they need to think about their, their, their property footprint. So that's a great example where thinking about impacts can actually also drive uh, better financial returns and reduce risk. Very interesting. Um, and sort of staying on the topic, we had a uh, a question uh, around sort of, do you have any, and I guess this is either to Johanna or Rob, do you have, uh, other than Shell, do you have any other examples of, uh, of I guess, a ESG investment uh, that has done well? Well, uh, so, so one of my favorite is Xylem Water, uh, which is a, a business that's in a number of our, our, our portfolios. But really, they help uh, everything from flood damage and flood protection uh, right the way through to sort of making, uh, taking dirty water into, into drinking water. Uh, and, and actually, to showcase their technology, they've, they've partnered with a football club in the UK called Manchester City. Uh, and they literally take the rainwater collected from the stadium uh, and in collaboration with Manchester City, turn that into a beer. And the beer is called Raining Champions uh, Beer. So a very clever uh, pun. But again, if you look at the share price of that business, that is a business that has been very much focused on driving a particular impact around water. Uh, and, you know, we all need clean water to live. Uh, we also need to think about how our rivers uh, you know, how our rivers interact, interact with our urban environment, the risk of flooding. Uh, so that is a business that has a massive positive impact, but has also had spectacular financial performance. If, if you don't know that company, I would definitely go and look up their share price over the last five years. Uh, a second company that I love is Nike. Nike, uh, we haven't really talked about this concept called the circular economy, but we need to shift. You know, unfortunately, I've grown up in a world of Milton Friedman, of this idea that we sort of take, make, and then waste stuff. We have stuff and then we throw it away. We cannot continue to live in that way. We need to embrace uh, a circular economy. And, and actually, it just requires redesigning a lot of our processes. Uh, and, and so Nike, about five years ago, really started thinking uh, about to what extent can they 
uh, make their products that we buy, their trainers, their clothes, uh, and and design or redesign their engineering process to make sure uh, that they're, they're made in a much more sustainable way. So more and more of their trainers now are made from recycled trainers. More and more of their products uh, are made from reused and recycled products. And that has a fantastic impact on Nike because what, what you're seeing is that once they made that capital investment, Nike has got what's called brand momentum because their younger consumers like buying these trainers that are made from 99% recycled products. Actually, amazingly, they can charge more for these premium products. And once they've made the CapEx investment in this, it turns out they can make these trainers for less than they used to make the old ones. So they've got brand momentum, they're making higher revenues. And actually, once they've made that CapEx investment, uh, they're, they're, they're generating higher profits. And so, you know, again, we want to get behind businesses like Nike that are, are embracing that circular economy. And then thirdly, I want to pick up Microsoft. Microsoft is our biggest holding. We have about $1.8 billion, uh, billion pound, sorry, $1.8 uh, billion pounds invested in, in Microsoft. Microsoft are probably the poster child of uh, E and climate change. Uh, but we engage with them on two issues. One is on gaming and responsible gaming. You know, they make a lot of money from producing computer games. Uh, and so we really want them to think about the impact on that. Uh, and the second thing is, obviously, they're at the cutting edge of uh, artificial intelligence. So, again, we're engaging with them on the ethics of artificial intelligence. Anything to add, Johanna? No, I think that, that Rob captured it very well. And I think that one of the challenges we face is sometimes, I mean, Microsoft's a good example because it's a big company, but there are lots of smaller companies that may be not represented by the big indices. And so a lot of work we do is try and identify certain themes, you know, clusters of themes that benefit from sustainability, like energy trans transition, like the circular economy, um, so that actually we can uh, continue to, to support the growth of companies like these. Again, when you, when you look at indices, typically what you see is companies have done well historically. And what we, we're really focused on is identifying the companies of the future. So a big area of focus for us in terms of the tools we're developing. That's great. And um, perhaps a final question, just uh, conscious of time, but um, I, the, this one has been uh, had uh, got some votes. Um, Alex Ondra asks that: uh, To what extent do you believe that, or um, what uh, do you believe will the Chinese real estate bubble bursting affect global markets? At present, the the RMB exchange rate is solidifying compared with the euro and uh, US dollar, and less inflating than the real estate issue would suggest. Any thoughts? Our central scenario is that we'll get a soft landing in China. So essentially, there's been a deleveraging of the system this year in China, which is actually quite a positive development. Again, it probably leads to more sustainable levels of growth over the long term. Um, but our expectation is that this is a highly managed situation. And actually, we're now starting to think about when is the point where we start to see easing uh, of liquidity in China. And I actually think it could be a very interesting area for investment next year as we start to see that liquidity cycle in China turn in a positive sense at a time where maybe liquidity will be, as I said, peaking in the developed markets. So, you know, we've been underweight China in all of our portfolios over the last um, uh, six months. But, you know, we're starting to reassess that view now. Um, we actually think that things are starting to look more interesting there for 2022. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, any um, concluding remarks from uh, any of you before uh, we hand this back to John Lin? Uh, Angelina, I was just going to really make the point uh, that Jun Ling made at the beginning, which is I think there's a really interesting opportunity. Well, what we know is from Daniel is that we're not wired to make good decisions about our future self. We know that we're living longer uh, and we know that uh, one of the ways to do that is to get advice. So I, I, I only joined SJP three years ago, although I've been a client for six years. I used to be a leading pensions consultant and I still had to get advice on my pension for all of the reasons uh, that Daniel said. And so I suppose uh, the, the, the message I want to leave people with is that there's a real opportunity to not only ensure the financial prosperity of you, your family, but, but that of your, your planet. And there's this real leverage effect that can, that, that can happen by, by tapping into the global financial markets and, and engaging with whoever manages your wealth uh, to make sure that they're doing it uh, in, in the right way. So, yeah, th those would be my, my final remarks. Daniel? 
I, I think there's a great opportunity to combine the two concepts that we've talked about today. You can change the world, you can make the world a better place, and in so doing, you personalize the process in a way that's going to lead to better behavior. People who are invested in a way that's more aligned with their personal values and their personal meaning are going to be more likely to stay the course so you can do the right thing for the planet, for right, do the right thing for people, and do the right thing for your own behavior and decision making. Two highly congruent concepts that we've touched on today. And any conclusion remarks, Johanna? I think, look, we need to recognize what, we, what we've just been through. In some sense, we're still living through, which is the pandemic. And my view is you don't get an event like thing, this and things go back to where, the way they were before. Um, so I don't think, I think things will never be the same. I think that we're in a highly disrupted world, real opportunity to make a change about how we live for the better in terms of incorporating sustainability and also huge opportunity to benefit from those disruptive trends and look to position our portfolios for the future. So I think it's actually a very exciting time um, to be, to be invested in the market. Very interesting. Thank you all for, for all our panel of experts. Um, if you have um, entered any questions into uh, the, the question box and uh, we haven't got around to uh, answering them, don't worry. Uh, one of SJP Asia's representatives will get back to you and we will make sure that we get an answer back to you. Uh, with all that, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the evening and, uh, and um, I will hand back to Zhong Lin. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you all. Thank you to our speakers and Angelina. There were some technical difficulties, but we've learned a lot, haven't we? So we've learned a lot today in these three key areas. One, we discussed how you can consider your impact and the greater role that you can play in influencing sustainability, which as we learned today, is vital given climate change is hanging in the balance. Two, we explored the obstacles that can often get in the way of making healthy investment decisions and last but not least, three, we illuminated the steps you can take given today's market outlook. So I shared some survey statistics with you at the start of our conference from the SJP Asia Money Relationship Monitor 2021. We will be launching this soon. And as you have joined us today, we will be sending you a link to download your very own copy of this report. We are committed to learning and developing these events to better serve you. To do this, please could I invite you to spend a couple of minutes completing the feedback survey in the virtual conference lobby. We would be very grateful for your feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending your time with us this evening. I hope you enjoyed our global lineup of experts today and that they have inspired you in one way or another to take action and help you discover how you can make a positive impact on your life and the world we live in. With that, we've come to the end of the 2021 St. James's Place Asia Client Conference, The New World of Wealth, and it is time for me to sign off. I wish you all a lovely rest of the evening and a wonderful rest of 2021.